Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions. We'll start with number one from Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to develop an industrial strategy for the River Clyde and its adjacent communities. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. Uh, we will work with the many public and private partners to help realise and connect key opportunities along the River Clyde. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that fairly brief answer. Um, does he agree that Hunterson and my constituency must play a key role in any River Clyde industrial strategy, given its unique assets and geographic location? And can I advise the Chamber what support the Scottish Government and its agencies will provide to stimulate investment and job creation at Hunterson? Cabinet Secretary. I, of course, uh, Presiding Officer, you've given us a clear instruction to get to the point, and that's exactly what I was trying to do. Of course, there are so many opportunities right along the... The, the River Clyde, it would take too long to list all of those opportunities. But the point is we want to create the right um, economic environment in which uh, all those economic opportunities along the Clyde cla can absolutely flourish. In specific reference to um, Mr Gibson's constituency and the interest at Hunterson, um, of course it has strategic importance in terms of location and the opportunity that there is. So the government's economic agencies, of course, are currently uh, considering um, uh, work uh, there uh, in terms of stimulating investment and job uh, creation. So I think there are immense uh, opportunities um, there. So what support will government provide? Well, through our economic agencies, we'll uh, look very seriously uh, at the uh, requests that come forward. We'll also be very proactive in infrastructure spend as well, the work around innovation, um, the energy policy also. And a further opportunity is working in partnership with local, uh, local authorities uh, and also the city deal proposition as well to see what further resources can go to the Ayrshire area. So I think there are many ways in which we can help uh, stimulate investment opportunities, help support job creation, of course mindful of the environmental concerns but fundamentally support uh, the opportunities specifically there and right across uh, the, the, the River Clyde and the many strategies that we have from industrial to, to tourism maximise the opportunities that exist and I'll certainly ensure that Mr Gibson is informed of, of the work that we're undertaking in that regard. Jamie Green. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the Hunterson uh, nuclear site in North Ayrshire is one of the largest employers in the area. So can he confirm if the Scottish Government's current moratorium on new nuclear development in Scotland will help or hinder the economy of North Ayrshire? This is a little bit uh, to adjacent, but maybe a very, very brief comment, Minister. Uh, well, I'm happy to um, refer the matter to the Energy Minister, who can revert back to Mr Green in terms of the specifics of energy policy as it relates to Hunterston. The point is there are other economic opportunities that the government is aware of, and we are currently looking at that case right now. Jackie Bailey. Could I, I add my support to the need for a River Clyde industrial strategy and in particular raise the opportunity of servicing the Scottish Government's own ferry fleet on the Clyde. They used to be serviced at Greenock, they now I understand are serviced in Liverpool. Will he return that work to Scotland as part of a River Clyde strategy? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I have a great deal of sympathy with the aspiration to simply select where work um, is carried out but in terms of um, procurement of course we have to operate within the law but yes I'm very attracted to ensuring as much work in terms of the industrial supply chain can stay in Scotland as possible maintenance and servicing as well without encroaching uh, unfairly into the procurement processes of other organizations but I will look very closely I look very closely at those uh, opportunities to see what else we can do to achieve the outcome that, that Jackie Bailey um, has expressed. And Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the petition that was handed in regarding the Save the Inch Green Dry Dock, but also can the Cabinet Secretary inform me of what discussions he and the Scottish Government have had with Denverclay Council about the City Deal project at Inch Green in Greenock? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, we are trying to ensure that uh, the City Deal process and the benefits of City Deal covers every part of Scotland. Um, of course, including the opportunities at Inverclyde. Again, I'm happy to refer the matter to the lead minister on city deals, eh, which is Michael Matheson, who can revert back to Mr McMillan with a more detailed answer. But the point of the city deals 
is to maximise the economic opportunities in partnership with key local uh, stakeholders, uh, the private sector as well, uh, and of course that's important. Uh, specifically uh, in relation to the dry dock, I was wa well aware of the coverage uh, that was received and the cross-party approach that's been made in that regard, and I'm very interested in making sure that uh, industrial opportunities are delivered right along the Clyde, uh, and we'll do everything we can to support that. Question number two has not been lodged. Question number three, Jenny Gilbreth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the implementation plan in the National Missing Persons Framework for Scotland. Minister Ash Denham. The National Missing Persons Framework, the first of its kind in Scotland, was launched in May 2017 and we reported on progress earlier this year. The framework has been backed by an investment of £60,000 to develop and deliver return discussion training, which is central to ensuring people do not fall into the pattern of going missing repeatedly. Additionally, we've committed £142,000 to the Missing People Charity to enhance awareness and use of their 24-hour helpline and tech safe facilities in Scotland. I've also recently written to all local authority chief executives to continue to actively support the implementation of the framework. Jenny Gilruth. I thank the Minister for that response. Alan Bryant was last seen outside Styx nightclub on Caskie Road in Glenrothes just after 2am on the 3rd of November 2013. Five years on, his family are no closer to finding out what happened to their son. Whilst I welcome the, minister's, uh, the missing persons framework in principle, can the minister outline what support is available for families of the long term missing? And will she commit to look again at how this strategy is implemented in practice to assist those family members like the Bryants who live with the daily torture of having a loved one go missing? Minister. I thank the member for raising that point and I join her in extending my thoughts to Alan Bryant's family and indeed all families who are missing a loved one. And I would like to reassure the member that Police Scotland do not close missing person cases and Mr Bryant's case remains open. Police Scotland will continue to investigate any new information that they receive. The National Missing Persons Framework recognises the need to support the families of missing people. I believe we are moving in the right direction on this, but there is more work to do. Um, I'd be happy to meet with Jenny Gilruth to discuss this important issue further if she would like that. Question number four, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will consider establishing a victims commissioner and, if not, how it plans to learn from the experiences of victims and witnesses in the shaping of public policy. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef. Uh, the issue was considered during the passage of the Victims and Witnesses Scotland Act 2014. We remain of the view that funding for victim support organisations is a more effective use of resources and we're providing £17.9 million in 2018-19. Uh, these organisations obviously represent the interests of victims and provide robust input to government consultation and indeed the development of policy. Uh, for example, the development of the new homicide service, uh, which will be operational by spring next year, will be directly informed by the views of victims' organisations and the experiences of victims' families. In addition, we're funding research to better understand the experiences of rape and sexual assault victim survivors, uh, which will help ensure the interests of victims are at the heart of our criminal justice system. Uh, in my new role, I've met a number of families of victims of, of homicide, indeed victims of uh, other crimes uh, as well. They have directly influenced uh, my own thinking and certainly uh, influenced the programme for government commitments in relation to the victims package. Uh, we're, learning better, we're learning from their experiences to better inform and indeed design support services and ensure that their voices will be heard. Thank you. We help you know your rights, we help protect your rights and we help influence change. That's how the Children's Commissioner describes his job. My constituent Kevin Woodburn lost his son in a violent attack on New Year's Day 2017. He didn't know his rights, no one gave him a copy of the victim's code and he feels let down at every turn by a justice system he believes is stacked in favour of the accused. Will the Cabinet Secretary agree to meet with Kevin and myself to hear firsthand why we believe a victim's commissioner is long overdue? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I first of all uh, recognise the work that Kezia Dugdale has done on this and particularly uh, can I put on record once again the Scottish Government's uh, condolences uh, for the loss of Sean Woodburn. I know the First Minister has met uh, with the family previously. Of course I would be uh, willing to, to meet with Kezia and indeed uh, with the Woodburn family. I have uh, had correspondence with Sean's grandfather Oliver uh, Woodburn uh, myself uh, as well. Uh, Kezia will be aware of the, 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 the variety of measures in the programme for government. Uh, having met with a number of, of families of victims of homicide myself, I think it's fair to say that we recognise throughout that family's journey, from the time a terrible tragedy like 
that happens right the way through the process, there are some gaps there which we are very, very keen through the victims package announced to, to try to make sure that we fill those gaps. Uh, but certainly a, a meeting with the family is something that, that I would welcome to help better inform uh, our, our development of this policy as we move forward. Angela Constance. Thank you. I know the Cabinet Secretary is aware uh, of my constituent Kirsty Maxwell who died 17 months ago in Benidorm in circumstances that remain unclear and that is well aware of the plight of her family. So following the programme for government commitment to improve services to victims, will this specifically include better support to families who have lost a loved one abroad given that there is a role for Police Scotland and victim support services as well as, course, as the Foreign and Commonwealth Office? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I thank Angela Constance for raising uh, the issue and once again express my sympathies to, to the Maxwell family and again recognise uh, how, how, uh, how much uh, Angela Constance has been advocating on, on, on their behalf. As she rightly mentions, of course, when it comes to the, the process, uh, the Foreign Commonwealth Office will, will take the lead in that, but she's absolutely right to mention the fact that uh, there could be some support services put in place uh, for the family uh, here in, in, in Scotland. And certainly when it comes to the victims package, uh, we are still thinking about how we further develop uh, some of those program for government commitments. So I'd be happy to, to discuss that with Angela Constance. As I say, the lead in terms of the role of the process is for the Foreign Commonwealth Office, but certainly uh, let me reflect on what support we can put in place for the family in Scotland uh, through, the, through the measures that were announced in the program for government. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In England and Wales, certain prisoners contribute a portion of any salary they earn from paid work out with the prison gates to a fund for victims of crime which is a good way to compensate those who suffer the most and can help deliver meaningful rehabilitation. So will the Cabinet Secretary consider introducing such a scheme in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, well, we are uh, currently uh, waiting uh, for Westminster when it comes to uh, in relation to our victim surcharge, uh, which we are keen to, to take forward. And I'll keep the member updated in that uh, conversation. Where we can learn from best practice across the UK, across Europe, or indeed anywhere else I'll be open-minded to that but of course uh, he will know about our plans for a victim surcharge and, and as I say we are still uh, waiting uh, for conversations to progress uh, with the UK government uh, in that respect and I'll keep him updated on that. Question number five Tom Arthur. To ask the Scottish government how it supports partnership working between colleges and industry. Minister Richard Lockhead. Partnership working with the industry must of course be at the heart of what our colleges do and of course our colleges play a key role in delivering educational opportunities that support individuals into the workplace and on to higher learning. So we continue to ensure that every college in Scotland is in a strong position to meet both the needs of learners and employers. Tom Arthur. Can I thank Richard Lockhead for that answer and welcome, to his, welcome him to his new position. Last week I had the pleasure of joining my colleagues Derek Mackay and Stuart McMillan for the launch of the AC White Skills Academy at West College Scotland in Greenock. This is a partnership between West College Scotland and Barhead based AC White who are a business who are one of the main contractors for the refurbishments of homes across the UK and specialists in external wall insulation. Having identified a skill shortage in the sector, their managing director, Jennifer Finn, and her team worked collaboratively with West College Scotland to develop this course, which offers a guaranteed job at the end of it. Does the minister agree with me that this is a fantastic example of partnership working, that West College Scotland and AC White should be commended for their endeavours? And will you join me in wishing all of the students on the course the very best for the coming year? Minister. Um, I thank the member for his question and of course uh, thank him for his kind words as well and he's quite right that partnership between West College Scotland and the AC White uh, with our new skills academy is the perfect example of colleges and employers working together and sets a really fine example for the rest of the country to follow. It's certainly an issue I intend to take very seriously is to ensure we can foster these relationships between our colleges and employers to address skills gaps and I join Tom Arthur in wishing all the students and indeed the employer AC White all the best. Jamie Halcrow Johnson. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I welcome the Minister to his new position as well? Um, obviously, it's important that courses are linked to the needs of industry and the wider labour market. So, can I ask the Minister if any assessment is made of whether college leavers enter employment relevant to their qualifications and how long any assessments may continue after they've entered the workplace? Richard Lockhead. Well, that's also an issue that I'm very keen to pursue as well. There are indeed many tracking uh, assessments of the destinations of students at our colleges and our universities. Uh, I'd be more than happy to look into that specific issue uh, for the member and drop him a note. But it's very important we do track the final destinations into the workplace of our students. Question number six, Dean Lockhart. 
Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's had with NHS Forth Valley regarding funding for GP services at the Aberfoyle Medical Centre. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. The Scottish Government is engaging with NHS Forth Valley and its constituent integration joint boards about their primary care improvement plans. I understand NHS Forth Valley provided discretionary funding to Aberfoyle and Buclivy medical practice under the historical associate GP scheme, funding which was tied to a particular post holder who has since retired. The Health Board is committed to retaining this funding to support all practices in the West Stirlingshire area, including the Aberfoyle and Buclivy practice. Dean Lockhart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. The Aberfoyle and Buclivy practice in my region is faced with diminished GP capacity due to the decision to withdraw funding for a GP. This has resulted in GP availability falling below the level needed to maintain an acceptable service to the local community and it also is putting the GP surgery at risk. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that in rural locations a higher proportion of GP availabil availability is essential and will she commit to reviewing the national guidance given for GP provision to reflect the specific needs of individual rural practices? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I, I need to start by disagreeing with Mr Lockhart's premise in terms of his supplementary question. Funding was not withdrawn. The funding was linked to uh, a particular uh, practice that in 2004, that practice was informed was no longer appropriate given the new uh, GP con uh, contract at that time. But Forth Valley continued that funding, making it perfectly clear as the practice knew that it was linked to a particular individual and would end when that individual retired, as is now the case. Nonetheless, Forth Valley have committed to retaining the funding as a whole and making sure that it is more equitably distributed across all the practices in the area. I need to also point out that that new investment will be made in the wider multidisciplinary teams to support the new GP contract, which of course, as members know, we uh, negotiated with the full support of the BMA and indeed secured the support of the majority of their members. Finally, let me say that the Scottish Government uh, announced uh, not only an increase in terms of that GP contract, but a 3% increase for independent contractor GPs in this year and an additional increase on their expenses. And as I'm sure the member knows, the Rural Short Life Working Group, chaired by Sir Lewis Ritchie, is looking at any particular issues that may apply to rural practices. And I look forward to receiving his recommendations. Finally, no GP practice in Scotland loses funding as a consequence of this well-supported and much welcomed GP contract. Bruce Crawford. Thank you, President Officer. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the most appropriate way to represent the good folk of the Aberfoyle and wider Bacalaivi area is to engage in a serious discussion with local people, with the local GPs, with local health board, here, here. and actually a, a, attend public meetings representing the people in your area? Here, here. Cabinet Secretary. Well, yes, I do agree with Mr Crawford, because fundamental to how we will reform and improve our primary health care services is that local engagement. And of course, elected members in this chamber have an important role to play, but I would also argue an important responsibility to ensure that that engagement is genuine, uh, reaches all parts of the communities that they represent and themselves participate in that. In that way, they can then represent the issues that are genuinely raised locally in this chamber and with this government. Question number seven, Graham Simpson. Uh, how many STEM apprentices there are and how many of these are in North and South Lanarkshire? Minister Jamie Hepburn. There are currently 21,050 STEM apprentices in Scotland based on published modern apprenticeship data for quarter one of 2018-19. Of these, 1,725 are in North Lanarkshire and 1,395 are in South Lanarkshire. Graeme Simpson. According to Equate Scotland, only 16% of higher education students in engineering and technology are women, and only 27% are women with a science, technology, engineering and maths university qualification remain in the sector. Can the Minister say what the Scottish Government is doing to encourage women onto STEM courses and into careers? Minister. Well, let, let me say I uh, recognise the issues that uh, Graeme Simpson have, has laid out. That's why, uh, through uh, Skills Development Scotland's Equality Action Plan, we are taking activity to ensure 
uh, that much more is done to uh, ensure that more women take part in uh, the various STEM uh, frameworks we have for modern apprenticeships. That's why we've laid out a STEM strategy to uh, encourage more young women to, to study STEM subjects at school. That's activity that's underway and it's activity will continue.